Uh, our agenda for today is uh, to uh, go through a high level architecture of CSFS and Procopis, uh, which is relevant to these slides, uh, and an access walkthrough when uh, a file is accessed for CSFS to identify the code paths that are relevant. Uh, and then we'll be presenting our problem statement uh, where uh, we, we go through the different scenarios and uh, uh, the place where we would like to uh, improve uh, in terms of memory usage. Uh, and then uh, we have a proposed solution and uh, the readings we have taken uh, before and after the change. Uh, we'll also go through uh, uh, different combinations that we have tried uh, and the results we have got. Uh, next slide. So uh, this, in this slide, uh, we can uh, see a high level uh, uh, diagram for CSFS. Uh, as we know, CSFS is a pseudo file system. It's, uh, it leverages parts of kernel FS and its primary purpose is to export uh, kernel objects uh, as files uh, where user space can tune uh, different attributes and uh, uh, adjust to the uh, uh, user's requirements. Uh, so there are three uh, top layers here. Uh, one is the common VFS layer, uh, and then we have the implementation from core CFS, and then there is kernel FS uh, from which CFS borrows uh, most of the code. Uh, so uh, the implementations for logistics of creating files uh, and uh, uh, their relevant handles are handled by kernel FS. The root itself is maintained by kernel FS. And uh, SysFS uh, manages the uh, file I.O. Uh, binding between a given kernel object and the actual uh, file handle. Uh, the important thing to note here is that uh, for uh, all the files and uh, uh, folders that are created for SysFS, uh, the inode and yeah. dentry uh, entries are actually stored uh, or shared with the common VFS layer which means that uh, the inodes are co-located with uh, other inodes that are present uh, for uh, file systems which are disk-based or uh, block devices. Uh, so uh, in, the, in the picture, we also uh, represented the two shared uh, caches, which are inode and dentry caches. Uh, and uh, they are uh, in slab memory where uh, there are uh, a series of slabs allocated and uh, uh, each slab could contain potentially uh, one or more uh, active objects. Uh, next slide. So similarly, uh, procfs uh, also is a pseudo file system which exposes processes to uh, and their internal data to user space. Uh, the uh, there are only two layers here. Uh, most of the implementation is within the procfs code. Uh, the operations are shared from VFS layer. Uh, but the cache that are uh, used for uh, storing uh, different uh, inode and dentry uh, entries are within the procfs layer they are not shared with the common vfs layer uh, and uh, the primary uh, data that is exposed is of process and their threads uh, there, there is uh, file handles uh, there are and there are internal uh, uh, values from the task structure are exposed uh, through uh, file file uh, file based mechanisms uh, next slide uh, here we are actually walking through uh, what happens when we try to access a particular uh, path from csfs so the path we have chosen to demonstrate this is uh, sys kernel boot params version uh, when we do a cat on it 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 prints out the uh, boot protocol version which currently is 2.15 uh, so the first step is uh, for the kernel FS uh, layer to do a lookup for if that path exists uh, and try to find the inode that represents the path. Uh, because we are first time accessing this path, uh, it wouldn't be able to find it. So it would try to allocate a new inode for the uh, given path uh, and it would try to associate a dentry with that inode. Uh, once this step is uh, complete, uh, the uh, control transfers to the uh, registration that happened for CSFS, which uh, uh, it tries to find the method that was registered for the read operation on that path. 
uh, and therefore uh, it will find out that version show is the function that's supposed to print the root protocol version uh, and uh, once it is done uh, the kernfs layer tries to uh, uh, unlink the file uh, but after unlinking the file uh, it does a deput on the dnt and inode where it adds the uh, corresponding uh, inode uh, to the lru list so uh, which means uh, it is preserving or retaining the inode structure uh, so that if we access this path uh, once again uh, it would uh, uh, not have to reallocate it uh, uh, but the uh, as we saw earlier the uh, one of the primary uh, use cases for csfs is to uh, dynamically allocate and remove uh, meaning uh, uh, they, uh, it doesn't have to retain in all scenarios. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, uh, the highlighted portion in the middle is where a new allocation happens and a new association with uh, uh, a D entry happens. And this is where uh, the problem statement and the appropriate solution lies. Uh, next slide. Uh, with that background, uh, we try to present the problem statement. Uh, so uh, because uh, CSFS and ProcFS, once uh, uh, the use case for a given path is done and when the unlink happens, uh, they retain uh, as many inodes as possible in the LRU list. Uh, the uh, amount of memory that, that is allocated to these entries uh, in a given time, let's say during boot or uh, subsequently when uh, a significant amount of uh, paths are accessed within the file system. Uh, the amount of page allocations for uh, these file systems would uh, be very high. Uh, if you see in the picture, uh, the uh, for for the given hierarchy, uh, let's say uh, A, B, C, and four. Uh, once four uh, is done accessing, it would stay in the inode would stay in the LRU list. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, subsequently, when we access three, it would still remain in memory. Uh, and uh, as we access more paths and more hierarchy, uh, all of them would be retained until there is a memory crunch or somebody uh, explicitly uh, drops cache on a given machine. Uh, so uh, our goal here is to reduce the overall memory required uh, during boot and later subsequently uh, for the amount of memory that is required for CSFS and ProcFS. Uh, Ajay would uh, continue with the uh, uh, solution we have proposed and the uh, readings we have. Yep, thanks, Monsi. Uh, I hope I am audible. Uh, so here uh, we are proposing a solution where we want to use this flag that is uh, D cache don't cache. Uh, so basically here on the uh, left side we can see a green box which is having a, a few elements uh, which we call as a metadata. So these are the metadata for any file system. Uh, most likely we can say as for the Pseudo file system. So let's take an example of this sysfs or procfs. So while creating a sysfs procfs, so first we will store uh, the data of file or folder uh, in form of metadata. So in case of sysfs, it's being stored uh, as a uh, kernel fs uh, within the system. So here in this diagram, we can see abc, those alphabetic. Uh, boxes are representing the folders and these one two three four these uh, numbers are representing the files so we can see a is having uh, b one and two so whenever the user will access uh, let's say it will access the four so uh, this request will go to the vfs layer so vfs layer will first check whether a is present or not if uh, vfs layer is able to find uh, uh, not able to find the a so correspondingly look up uh, function of that particular file system so let's say in this example it's a sysfs so sysfs lookup function will be and it will pick the metadata uh, pick the uh, metadata for a and it will create a, a. so similarly uh, again for b c and 4 
so right now if we are not having anything so here we can see the inode used and dnt used are zero so once we will access uh, this four so it will create and for each element it will use one inode and one d entry so the uh, there are four inodes and four d entries we are using so uh, let's say uh, now we are accessing the three similarly a and b was already created for the vfs layer so vfs layer will bypass the calling of lookup for a and b and it will directly call the three so so as of now uh, whatever we have seen on the slide so this is already implemented uh, in our kernel so now the next step is what exactly we want to change uh, for these procedural file system most likely for sysfs and procfs that is so up to now whatever we have created as in the form of inode d entries so these are in the system once the user will uh, close these files or last d put we will call so at that time these files as per the current implementation these will go to the lru list and it will remain in the memory till there is no crunch of the memory till user will not call the drop cache or anything it will be remain in the memory so once uh, you uh, so once we will call this last d put so let's take now with our implementation that is with d cache don't cache so what is the difference here we don't want to retain these inode or d entries so if we will add this d cache don't entry so it will directly uh, it will not put into the lru list instead it will directly go into the rcu list to free these uh, inode and d entries so now here we need to understand two steps are there the first step is if we will free these d entries it will go back to the cache and slab layers so it is ready to be reused and if there are a lot of uh, free of these d entries and d cache so it may happen it it is actually happening in the system so in sometimes we will free the uh, slab uh, from the cache and which eventually free up the pages so our main idea is to uh, either keep this uh, this to be in the slabs or free the pages if it is not required with this uh, implementation these are the uh, readings which we got so here we are uh, comparing with the current implementation with the don't cache file or folder so at the first line uh, we have seen some uh, degradation or we can say side effect so boot up time uh, earlier in our system with the current implementation we have observed like it's 1. Uh, sorry 8.143 second which is increased to 8.739 second so this degradation is because of uh, the a lot of access of the lookup so in the next point we can see uh, sysfs and procfs lookup called so this is basically we have measured during the boot up time uh, whenever we will access sysfs and procfs so the lookup will be called so with the current implementation the count is around 10k and with this implementation this count has been increased to 45k this is because uh, in this uh, 10k uh, current implementation we were not retaining anything uh, sorry we were retaining uh, the files and folders but with 45k we are not retaining anything we are keep on flushing and recreating all the entries but the benefit we are getting that is here in the inode and d entry so with the current implementation just after completion of the boot we have seen these uh, inode and d entries is being used uh, that is near to the 11k but with our implementation because it is keep on uh, freeing and uh, regenerating so it is near about 2800 so uh, and memory free we have observed just after the boot that difference is near about uh, 11 to 12 mb so with our approach uh, we are having more free memory of near about 12 memory 
and there are some experiment we have done like uh, if we will do the drop cache immediately after booting the system so these uh, i node and d entry so which is around 11k so this is reduced to uh, 100 uh, 1800 uh, in the normal case and it should be a same uh, so these readings are almost same uh, with this one so this is around again 1800 and the memory free in this case is uh, again 7 to 8 MB. So now we want to access the sysfs completely. So with find command, we completely access the sysfs. So this again increased from 1800 to 4700. But in our case, it just increased from 1800 to 27, uh, 2200. So here we can see a difference. So here in this uh, current implementation, it increased uh, like 3000 but in this case it increased just in some hundreds and memory free again we are having near about uh, i guess 9 to 10 mb of memory so here uh, as we have seen there is a some degradation uh, which is not acceptable that is in the boot time so what we try to improve this is this is here so in this approach, uh, we try to apply this D cache, don't cache only for the files. We don't want to apply for the folders. So if we will apply this only for the files, so uh, so what is happening now? So we are basically combining both current implementation and the D cache implementation. So current implementation will be for our folders and uh, don't cache will be for our files. So we have already seen whenever someone will access uh, so we will be having uh, i node used four and five so in earlier case if we will apply don't cache for file and folder both so these value will become zero once the access is done but in this case uh, it will become to three because all the files will go away whenever there is a last deput and only the folders uh, will remain in the LRU. So in short, uh, with this approach, uh, your folders will be retained, means all the inode and the entry will go into the LRU list, but your file and folders will not be retained on the last access on your last input. So these will be uh, erased. So these will go to the RCU list and will be freed uh, immediately once the access is done. And now because uh, there are a lot of uh, files will be freed, uh, maybe you can say in that during the boot time. So a lot of uh, free slabs uh, will be available. A lot of objects will be available at the slabs. And if there are more than uh, uh, files which is present in the slabs are freed, so we will be uh, keep on freeing the slab. So this way, this will give us uh, more benefit in term of uh, like there is no side effect. So here uh, we have added this the last part along with the this one. So the first uh, middle one is again the current implementation. The middle uh, the second one is don't cache file and folder, and the third one is don't cache file. So in the third one, we can see uh, our boot time is slightly increased, but it is almost same as the current implementation, which is now increased from 8.143 second to 8.60 second. Uh, and this uh, this reading is because of this 19k. So this is now 19k. Earlier it was, I mean, with current implementation, it's 10k and it increased to 45k. And I node used is slightly more because now we are retaining the D entry, uh, retaining the directories. So this difference here from it to uh, 2800 to 60 is because of uh, we are preserving the directories. Okay. And mem free earlier it was high like uh, 10 to 11 MB. So now it is less near about 6 to 7 MB. And if we do the same experiment, so these values are almost same I know re entries and there is a slightly difference in the memory because uh, same thing uh, we are preserving for the directories. And if we will access uh, sysfs, so it will be now uh, slightly increased because in this case, uh, uh, direct, I mean, D entries and I node for directory will be retained. 
and with this approach we got a slightly uh, not better as much as we have already seen in the file and folder but better than the current implementation so near about 6 to 7 mb of the improvement we can see uh, without any side effect so that's uh, all if uh, there will be any question and answer we are happy to accept yeah, I can try answering that. Uh, so mm -hmm. what we have noticed is when we have uh, virtual machines or uh, Linux machines with small memory footprint, uh, for example, let's say something has to run with uh, uh, 256 MB of RAM uh, or uh, maybe 512 MB of RAM in embedded or uh, in a small virtual machine, uh, the sh short term memory pressure when booting or when accessing is much higher uh in the current implementation uh, which means that uh the rest of the system uh when when it is uh when it has to load other things would have lesser memory uh, at hand during this process so because we do not need uh all of it at once uh, one of the one of special cases is booting and the next subsequently when uh, the system is booting up and a particular uh, device structure is getting accessed. So what we have noticed is that it increases a short term memory pressure during boot and during specific path access, uh, which could be improved uh, and therefore more things can run at the same time. Uh, yeah. OK, um, that was a design decision. We did this. We used to have it with no cache and it was it was Fast, it was slow, and um, it didn't use any memory. And we, SysFS, the way this is designed is to go fast. The problem is big machines, 30,000 disks on a 32-bit 30, a processor, um, 10,000 processors, um, fun things like that. The people working on this have been um, eking out small, small percentages of speed over the past couple of years. And we cannot take any patches to make this slower. It's just not going to work. Um, so I'm all for saving memory, but this is an explicit design decision of this code. So it's working as design, <laughs> um, but we can't we can't go backwards. Um, no, it's, so short-term memory pressure for virtual machines is, um, I'd say, just fix your user space processes not to scan, or give it a big give it a boost of memory. Or something else. Um, anyway, this is that, that's why it is the way it is, and that's going to be your pushback if you ever try and send patches like this. Just to give you a heads up. Uh, I have a question on top of that. So, would uh, would this can this be optional for a type of file that is accessed? For example, uh, if a certain certain uh, machine wants to do this with lower memory pressure. Uh, so instead of making something default, we'll leave the current default on. But we could, uh, uh, for example, during opening the file or in any other form, make uh, or even as a boot param or other ways, uh, make the selection optional, uh, where the default would remain the current default. So certain machine, certain uh, lower memory machines can benefit from it, and the rest can use the normal methods. I'd have to see that. I, I doubt it. You're not going to be able to change user space, um, and you're not going to be able to change SysFS because the, the reason kernFS is there is to try and keep the, do this caching layer, and that's why it's the complexity as it is. That's why the extra indirection is there, and it's all to go faster because w memory is there, the cache is there. So the best example, best thing to do is just boost your memory in the beginning, then shrink it when you're done. You're a virtual machine, you can do that. Um, booting is very rare. So, you, and people care about boot times of virtual machines too. Everything's a trade off, right? Uh, Greg, uh, why uh, can, uh, this SysFS and ProcFS is different? Why ProcFS is not using kernel FS? Uh, anything you are aware of? Yeah, because it's just history. Nobody did the work. 
ProcFS was first. And also the use case is different. ProcFS, if you, if you, ProcFS is hit hard, really, really hard, really fast for lots of monitoring processes all the time. So it's tuned for that usage model. SysFS is tuned for the, you open a file every once in a while and it is not a fast path, except a boot. <laughs> and then you cache it and then you walk away with the memory. Um, and then it's just so, I mean, you can try converting ProcFS to KernFS, but I think it'll slow things down and make the people who are running the monitoring tools very upset. Um, hello there. Um, so my name's Thanks. Steven. I'm probably one of those people that Greg's talking about that would be, uh, that, that are eking out the small performance gains on ProcFS and SysFS. So I, I can confirm a lot of what he's saying there. Um, in particular, you know, these are all shared data structures. There's only one, and when you've got 100 CPUs, it's, it's just a horrible place to be to all be contending for them. Uh, but that aside, it seems like this is a sort of thing that could be done, maybe not on a per file basis, but maybe as a configuration, a config time, or a boot parameter, where they can statically ena enable this at boot time. Like, I don't want ProcFS to be cached. Um, that might be an option to look into, and it would satisfy people like me who will never enable that, but. No, no, we, I mean, the whole goal is having a general purpose operating system is to work just barely for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so that would add complexity, and we don't want to add module parameters, we want to add, want to add command line options. It should just work, and right now it really, really works well for speed, and that's what it's designed for. Um, whether we, it's you get speed or you get memory, it's the trade-off. We made the design decision of speed because memory is free and speed isn't. So um, that's just the way it works. So um, I mean, and you guys proved it very well with the benchmarks. Thank you. So <laughs> it's, just, it's working as designed. Take one. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll give you a little rest from that one <clears throat> with a trivia question. Why does the system call read of proc interrupts take a long time? Why does it not complete reading the entire file in one read and come back? So I, I, have, a, I have a syscall for this. Do you? Like, I do. I have a read file syscall. Really? And it, I've tried to, I propose it every year. It's in my tree. I rely on my systems. But it turns out it doesn't really save any time. Oh. It turns three syscalls into one, but it, it just, I keep wanting to patch you to um, what the, the base for proc or for the monitoring tools. We tried it and it maybe it ekes out some performance, but nobody's been willing to. I can't understand it. why this is sitting in memory. It's a memory file system, and I do a read, and it just I say here I have 4K buffer, and it just says, oh, we'll give you the first few lines, and then come back for the rest. I'm like, what? <laughs> well, no, yeah, that, no, we have I have a patch, for, I have a change for that, but it just nobody wants to take it, and I'll submit it again. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I don't understand the cause. I'm baffled because I've got some, I actually have some tools, and the slowest part is reading proc interrupts yeah. of my tools, which has just blew my mind. So, anyway. hey, maybe you'll, I, I'll right. let you take my system. I'll test it for you. <laughs> okay. uh, just would there be any advantage yeah, in like, making next. a drop cache as equivalent that's less, you know, it doesn't drop everything, that just drops these ones? Like, you know, you've gone, because I'm sure the boot they've done is to a shell, not to like a, de you know, when you've got a desktop with UDEV and you've got a whole other stuff like that, that this is useful for. But when you've got to a sort of a, I've, I've booted, well, just shell. drop these ones. You don't well, need to a shell, uh, if you just boot to a net, you're not going to hit SysFS. No, but I mean, oh, yeah, it's, it's hitting, hitting SysFS. Like, yeah, right. like with a login, just not as graphical login, like with all of the extra stuff that that probes. But just to that, yeah, you'd have us run. But at that point, is there, you know, is there an advantage then to just having like a drop caches just for these bits because we we, we know we're never going to need them again, but rather than having to, rather than just or, you know, so just get rid of the LRU after a few seconds. Or, but that's what the LRU does. But does it get rid of it after a few seconds? Or just leaves it in memory. It leaves it for forever until well, it leaves until there's memory pressure. Until there's pressure, yeah. But is there an advantage then of yeah of asking whether they okay so drop it leaves it until memory? But I don't know. Does that help? I don't yeah, know. I don't know. That's what I'm just wondering. Would it make sense to have a, pro a drop caches? Or, you know, with less, don't drop every cache. Maybe on a file system basis, but then you gotta yeah. touch the VFS and then three higher, no. All right. Anyway. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, can online, I think it's your turn. You have the raised hand. Yep. Oh, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
Uh, so I, uh, I have a separate question. So if we let the inodes goes away, uh, how can we how how can we persist the security blob? So that such as a Linux label or the smart label, which is previously set into the file, uh, how can we persist to that kind of information? Uh, is your question uh, what, what would happen if there is any uh, SLNX context on the file when uh, it was dropped? Yes, and we we actually saw this behavior with uh, proxies control file where we set some uh, smart label and after uh, after the memory eviction uh, code, uh, because some memory pressure, the all the labels are gone in the proc syscontrol files. So uh, this may be okay for the sysfs file because it has some patches applied more than decades ago. Uh, but it, this, the, the same problem may happen in the all the proc files. Okay, so yeah, we haven't seen it in this perspective. Uh, we'll have to. Uh, uh, understand when uh, these are uh, so the use case is to label proc fs paths uh, and uh, what you wanting to retain it even though there is a drop cache is that the mm -hmm. use case uh yes, uh, yes basically yeah maybe it's a little beyond what we have presented in the sense the since the problem exists for any drop cache meaning any memory pressure uh, I, I directly don't have an answer. We'll uh, go back and check uh, if it's feasible. Uh, but if anybody else has a, something to add, please do. Yeah, I think I think it's not too general because the, if the if the file system is uh, backed by the persistent storage, the the same information can be related from the, the physical device and set it to the the inode security blob. But uh, I think this is only for the issue with the uh, memory only file system such as SysFS or PROC. can't say I can add anything to the, the security here, so I don't want to change the topic unless somebody else has already has more okay. info on that. Hearing none, uh, just wanted to throw out the other thought here that this feels to me like a failure in caching a little bit, or I mean, this is not a failure, but a, a cache policy choice. And, and I, have had fr my own frustrations about memory getting used by dentries in different workloads that uh, and, and inodes that that just sticks around for a long time and it would be really nice if user space had more control over a policy that was in use for the lru because you're right as it is it just sits there until there's memory pressure and then either memory pressure like say you're a big system memory pressure never hits and then you have some issues due to lots of some other issues due to lots of dentries or whatever. In your case, the memory pressure does hit, but it sounds like uh, then it's too slow to free up that memory or, or some other issue. Perhaps a solution for everyone here is, is, is some sort of policy management on the isn't LRU. There, isn't there a C group for that? A C group, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, for some of that. just do the init and assign your Sisyphus walking program to a smaller memory allocation and Away you go. Good idea. So hey, it solved in user space. <laughs> <laughs> you you dev and system D should probably be in its own C group anyway. For that. You're here. <laughs> I know. I mean, seriously, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, thank you very much, and everybody will be back in a half hour. Thank you. Thank you.